Hello, and welcome to our program this evening. I'm Stephanie Gaspar, president of Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society, and appreciate everyone watching our program. We will continue with virtual meetings this spring and resume face-to-face -face once our board of directors feel it is safer for folks to come on out. Last month, we had UCF student Lauren Paleo talk to us about the effects of climate change on gray catbirds. It was such an interesting program and I received great feedback. Next month, we have guest speaker, Paul Eisenbrown. He will take us on a birding tour through Kissimmee Valley. Many of the places he travels to is very accessible to folks in Osceola County or the surrounding areas. Eagles are his favorite subject, so we can be sure to see some great photography and hopefully some updates on our local nests. Stay up to date with our programs by following us on Facebook and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. This evening, I am very pleased to present Dr. Jason Fisher as our guest speaker. I've recently become acquainted with him through my involvement with the Purple Martin Project. His work involves supporting international avian conservation efforts with the Disney Conservation Fund and developing research and engagement programs focused on the bird species that call Walt Disney Parks and Resort home. Type any questions you have in the chat and we can answer them during the presentation and afterwards. So thank you very much for joining us, everyone. And I look forward to the presentation. Welcome, Jason. I will pass it over to you now. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that introduction, Stephanie. And thanks all to you for uh, joining in tonight uh, for, for story time with Jason. Uh, I am really looking forward to, to taking you on a little journey through uh, the ins and outs of what Disney conservation is all about. Uh, and we'll be using some examples um, over the course of the chat tonight of, of what my role in supporting avian projects uh, is in allowing Disney conservation to, to do what it does. So before we get into um, my job now, though, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of background uh, about me, where, where I came from and, and how I came to be here uh, today. So I, I'm a desert rat. I was born in, in Arizona. Uh, and I knew from a very early age, you know, this animal science thing, it was for me. Uh, but I didn't really know what that meant. And so, you know, over the course of my career, I kind of dabbled in lots of, of different, different things. You know, I worked uh, or I volunteered all through high school at the Phoenix Zoo. Uh, then in, in college during summers, I worked for the Arizona Game and Fish Department studying this, this tiny little nondescript bird, the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher uh, in riparian uh, areas of, of Arizona. Arizona, uh, and 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 just fell in love with with field research. I headed off uh, after that um, to become a wildlife consultant for a few years. See what see what the private sector looked like, and and then collectively, all of those experiences really really showed me how much I enjoyed. Uh, research and uh, conservation and education. And so I went uh, back to uh, graduate school at the University of Illinois for my uh, graduate work. And the other thing that really came out of my time uh, in, in trying out those, those different jobs is I was and still am fascinated by the way that people and nature uh, interact. And, and that really was what led to, to my uh, research as a graduate student, um, focusing on urban ecology of birds. Um, you know, we create these places for ourselves, uh, and often wildlife are able to adapt and thrive in those. Uh, but some species might have a little more trouble. Some species flat out won't come into those developed areas at all. And, and navigating the ins and outs of, of why some species are able to make those adaptive changes and others um, aren't um, is, is totally fascinating to me and, and really uh, underpins a lot of the kinds of things I'm interested in as a conservation biologist. Now, when I graduated, uh, originally the plan was, okay, I've graduated, I've got my PhD, I'm heading off into the big wide world and I'm gonna become a faculty professor. I'm going to inspire young minds. I'm going to, to study these fascinating questions I'm interested in and contribute to, to conservation. And as so often happens in, in careers, uh, sometimes things take an unexpected turn in a really amazing direction. Uh, so out of grad school, I, I applied to this job, uh, the conservation program manager position uh, with 
uh, Disney's Animal Science and Environment. Uh, and it was a contract renewable position for one year at a time. And, and six months in, I was like, this is it. Uh, education, conservation, research, all in one incredible package with a, a company that I was really excited to be a part of. Uh, and the rest is history. Uh, I've continued on for the last five years here uh, and, and totally loved and am enamored of uh, both the job that I get to do, the people that I get to work with, uh, and the folks that I get to, to interact with. Um, I, my, my heart wishes that we could all be together in the same room uh, interacting. My, my preference is, is to have these kinds of things be uh, more informal, more discussion-based. Uh, and so I want you to know I'm keeping an eye on uh, the chat feature. Um, and so if you have any questions, throw them in there, uh, and I will try and respond to them as I go. I've also told Stephanie, totally fine to interrupt me as we go uh, with questions uh, if I miss them or if she has questions as well. So we'll do our best to kind of have this be a little bit more uh, informal as we go. But um, with all of that said, let's jump in to what my role includes now and what the work of Disney conservation uh, entails. To get there though, we got to take a step back, a step way, way back uh, to where for Disney it all started. And that is with the man himself, uh, Walt Disney. Now, a lot of people when they think Disney don't think conservation right off the bat. Uh, but if you look at what his early career um, entailed, he was actually a pioneer in trying to make nature accessible uh, to people. As, as the person who really drove and led the effort um, to, to make animation mainstream, a lot of his characters were based on wild animals. Uh, and, and he went out of his way to really try and capture um, the movements, the nature behind uh, how animals moved, how they interacted uh, in his films. He famously brought animals in for his animators to look at while they were, while they were creating and drawing those. Um, but much more beyond that, he, he really popularized the concept of the nature documentary. Uh, in this whole series called True Life Adventures, he brought um, folks in their living rooms into the wild to really see um, what life was like uh, for animals um, in the process of doing what they do. And, and since then, uh, nature and, and animals have been an ongoing theme uh, through all the, the animated features of the Walt Disney Company. Uh, and, and of course, I'm, I'm sitting here right now at Disney's Animal Kingdom, uh, and we're just across the way. We've got um, Animal Kingdom Lodge and the Seas uh, with Nemo and friends. And, and, and so we're we're fully embracing this concept of nature uh, as a way of uh, bringing folks in to experience it here at our parks and resorts as well. But all of that being said, today we're focusing on the wilds. Uh, and, and we as Disney Conservation really try and continue on that legacy um, that Walt Disney started. So Disney Conservation, uh, our, at Disney Conservation, our vision is a global community inspired to save wildlife and protect this planet we call home. Uh, and, and I wanted to start with that because um, it's important to me that when I read that vision, the word Disney isn't actually in that because at the end of the day, it's not about uh, Disney, it's about us. It's about what we together can do to make a difference in our own lives and collectively um, as a species uh, to create places where people and wildlife thrive at the very same time. So um, the rest of this talk is gonna be about how uh, Disney conservation uh, and specifically um, in my role, our avian projects, we're trying to do that, work with partners, work with other organizations, work with other people uh, to create a, a place uh, that animals and people can be living together, living in together. So um, at Disney Conservation, we, we kind of uh, tier our work up into three different buckets. Um, and and, and the, the way we do that falls into two categories. So on the one hand, we've got the Disney Conservation Fund, uh, which for the last 25 years has been donating uh, big dollars, a little over $100 million at, at last count to support global 
uh, conservation organizations to allow them to continue doing the amazing work um, that, that they already do. And in the course of doing that, they kind of break what they do up into these three different granting categories of saving wildlife, inspiring action, and protecting the planet. But those three categories carry over as well into the work that the marine team and the terrestrial team do. Uh, I'm on the terrestrial side. Uh, and, and collectively, we want to figure out how we can either lead or support projects in, in making um, meaningful impact from a conservation perspective, uh, as well as how do we support, how do we come together, how do we work with communities and organizations to make that happen, to that inspiring action idea. And, and finally, on that protecting the planet piece, you know, where can we take um, the skill sets, the abilities, the resources that are uniquely Disney and plug those in to make um, the biggest the biggest difference for conservation. So that kind of three tier bucket um, on the granting side, um, just a little little bit of additional background for you. We're going to spend most of our chatting time here on the saving wildlife side. Um, more on that in a sec. But our inspiring action grants are um, focused in on supporting organizations for a two year period. Um, and then every year, additional folks can submit grants. Uh, so in the Central Florida area, if, if you uh, know of an organization that would that needs some support, and is really doing amazing conservation work, uh, we just finished um, in October, the call for next year's work, but come next October, there'll be additional calls. So um, please always, uh, if you have questions or um, ideas, send them my way. I'd love to chat um, about how we can continue to support an ever increasing number of amazing uh, organizations. So that said, let's jump back to saving wildlife. So our saving wildlife grants were, they, they came about um, about six years ago from a recognition that the annual grant process we had was great uh, in that it really allowed us to support some incredible organizations globally. However, um, for the most impactful outcomes, organizations need to have a baseline of, of reliable, um, consistent support. And so we selected 10 different organizations doing work on 10 imperiled taxa, and we formed a longer term decade long partnership um, with those um, groups to, to really try and leverage not just the monetary resources of the Disney Conservation Fund, but also the expertise um, on Disney conservation on our Disney's animal science and environment team to work together to make the biggest difference possible um, for these different imperil taxa. So I'm not going to dive into the other nine today because uh, we're talking birds, but just very briefly, I'm going to run through, uh, run through them. So that crane, that's a little hint of what's coming next. Um, but we support uh, tamarin work in South America, especially with cotton top tamarins in Colombia and with golden lion tamarins uh, in Brazil. We do uh, butterfly uh, conservation work focused in Florida and in California on imperiled butterfly species. We work with great apes in the Democratic uh, Congo, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, we support rhino, uh, rhino conservation, uh, both in terms of uh, species in Africa as uh, well as with Sumatran uh, rhinos. Um, African elephants is another major focus uh, for us. Corals uh, are declining at, at really terrifying rates um, around the world, and our efforts are really honing in on uh, Bahamian coral conservation. Sharks and rays are another one of those groups that um, unfortunately are not doing well, and we are at the early stages of, of exploring um, partnerships and projects focusing on small, small tooth uh, sawfish conservation here uh, on off the coast of Florida. Sea turtles is another main focus of ours, uh, and that effort, um, while it uh, is beyond just Florida uh, at Disney's Vero Beach Resort, just a couple hours from here, um, that stretch that is part of a stretch of beach that is the most important nesting beach for the loggerhead sea turtle globally. It used to be that it was one of two, but unfortunately, that second one over in Oman, those populations have really crashed, and so now it is 
the most important nesting beach in the world for that species. And then sea um, green sea turtles uh, and uh, leatherback sea turtles also nest there as well. And finally, uh, big cats. So um, we have supported work in Sumatra with, with tigers, as well as uh, with African lions as well. So a lot of great work with a lot of great organizations underway. But today, we're going to take a deeper dive into Siberian crane conservation uh, in partnership with the International Crane Foundation. I get really, I, I am very lucky that I have been able to partner um, through my career with Disney with uh, International Crane Foundation or ICF for short, uh, because they do absolutely incredible work and Siberian cranes are um, in, in great need of conservation. So more on that in just a little bit. So this image that you're looking at right here really summarizes a lot of the different aspects of, of Siberian crane biology. Um, adults, male and female, um, are both this pure white with, with black flight feathers and this really kind of blood red uh, face that tapers off into a dark black tip bill and just a brilliant yellow, yellow eye. They're an incredibly striking bird, really, really beautiful. Um, as the habitat in this picture suggests, these are aquatic specialists. Of all of the crane species in the world, these are the most aquatic, uh, and you are least likely to see a Siberian crane out of the water than any other crane species. Now, the reason for that is that virtually everything they eat are, is plant matter um, that they forage on uh, underwater. Not just any plant matter, but they like the buds and the roots and the tubers of aquatic vegetation. Now that means that the height of the water is tremendously important to them. If it's too deep, they won't be able to forage. If, um, if a wetland dries out, then they can't dig through the mud to get to those uh, to get to those food items that, that they are after. And so um, wetland management, that's really at the core of what Siberian crane conservation is all about. Now, another thing that you can see in this photo is that you've got three birds together. You've got two adults, um, the male and the female white, and you notice you can't see differences between them because they're, um, they're not sexually dimorphic. And then you've got junior in between them. So cranes uh, often lay uh, one to two eggs, but it's very rare for that second um, chick to survive. And, and uh, a young crane is called a colt. So if you, hear me, if you hear me switch between chick and colt, it's not because I'm confusing cranes and horses. It's, it's because their uh, young are called the same term. So colts um, are incredibly dependent on their parents for a much longer period of time than a lot of other birds. Um, they are uh, raised by their uh, parents on the breeding grounds. They migrate together, they winter together, and it's not until after that complete uh, wintering season where the migration, um, the spring migration, I'm sorry, yeah, I got that right. The spring migration happens that they separate and go their separate ways. Now, those details are going to come uh, come in important as this chat continues. So hang on to them uh, in the back of your mind. So I mentioned already that Siberian cranes are a migratory bird, um, and they're not just a little migratory. They've got the longest migration of, uh, of any of the crane species. They uh, breed, as their name would suggest, all the way up in far northern Russia, uh, in Siberia. Now, once upon a time, there were actually three different populations of Siberian cranes. There was uh, these two in the west, one of which would winter in Iran, one of which would winter in India, and then both of these populations collectively migrated north to the same um, breeding area in Russia. Now, unfortunately, both of these two Western populations are gone. Um, through hunting pressure, uh, through habitat change, they have essentially been um, extirpated. There is uh, occasionally a sighting of one or two birds, uh, but with such a low number of birds, um, those individuals are essentially living out their life uh, and, and that population is functionally gone. And so that brings us to the single and only population of, of Siberian cranes remaining, uh, this population in the east. And so these birds, uh, 
also breed up in uh, Siberia. And then they migrate down through northern China and into southern uh, southern China where they spend uh, where they spend the winter. So we're going to talk through in depth the ins and outs of the challenges they face along the way and what the international con uh, or what ICF in partnership with Disney is doing to try and make a difference for those species. Excuse Stephanie, you. I just saw you pop in. Do you have a question? Uh, a quick question is, is the Western population, although they're not there anymore, were they genetically the, uh, the same as the Eastern population? That's a great question. I'm going to cycle back in that picture. And you'll notice that these are completely disparate um, populations. So these uh, groups do not interbreed, do not um, meet at any point, and do not uh, intermix. So I don't know the level of genetic differentiation. Um, morphologically, visually, they still look very similar, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's been some divergence uh, between, between those uh, two groups. Okay, thank you. Great question. All right. The one other thing that I want to, to point out while we're on this figure, um, this migratory pathway that tracks uh, where Siberian cranes go also overlays with the area of the highest level of crane diversity anywhere in the world. We've got 15 cranes globally. Eight of them can be found in Eastern Asia. Uh, and four of them, including Siberian cranes, are imperiled. And so protecting Siberian cranes really allows um, for the protection of these other um, imperiled crane species and other wetland species that depend on similar habitats. So red crown cranes, uh, as well as hooded cranes, as well as white nape cranes, all utilize the same area, similar uh, habitats. So I'll be focusing in on Siberian cranes, but really this, this story since this project started and was very focused on Siberian cranes is evolving to be more multifaceted and, and include these uh, additional crane species as well. So if you have any non-Siberian crane questions, I'd be happy uh, to answer those as well. But we'll focus in on cranes, on the Siberian crane um, for the next chunk of the presentation. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you on the migratory journey of the crane. And along the way, we'll talk about um, the struggles, challenges, and solutions um, that are underway. So let's start in the far north. So as you can tell from this map, we're talking about the farthest possible north uh, a crane can go and still be on mainland Russia. Uh, and so this habitat up here, this is, is tundra that these birds are breeding in. These are vast, vast landscapes, wide open places. Uh, and you'll notice in this wide open space, there is a crane. And that is because these birds um, nest in incredibly low densities, which means they need a huge amount of land in which to nest. So that's a challenge. Anytime you need more land uh, as opposed to less to do what you do, you're going to run uh, into potential issues. The other challenge is this is an incredibly challenging climate in which to breed. So when the birds first arrive, this is what they roll into. Uh, it is frozen tundra when the birds first get there in, uh, in early summer. And what happens next really depends on the climatological um, or on the weather patterns that have been happening both prior to earlier in the winter and during their arrival and following. So things like how much snow came down, how warm it is, and subsequently how quickly and how much that snow melts. Um, they are nesting on permafrost. So underground, there are layers that actually remain frozen the entire time that they are nesting on top of it. If it gets too warm, that permafrost can actually thaw um, and that can have negative consequences. consequences. Uh, if it's too dry or if it's too wet, those um, flat peatlands where they are um, nesting can either flood or become too dry. So climate and climate change has the potential to radically impact these birds. And year on year, there's a high amount of fluctuation in whether it's a very successful breeding year or whether things crash. Um, this past year was a really hard year uh, because it was very 
warm and dry. And the um, some of the permafrost actually thawed and some fires started, uh, got down into that permafrost, uh, which was no longer um, no longer frozen. And that is such thick, rich organic matter, it burns almost like coal to the point that the fire can get down in underground and continue to burn even through a Siberian winter. And then the following year, when it thaws out and warms up, that fire can spring out again to the surface. So there was major issues with smoke uh, and, and habitat damage from fire last year that was not, not normal. This is the other thing that the cranes have to deal with, as well as the researchers trying to study the cranes. This is one of our uh, Russian colleagues. Uh, and those, if you are wondering, those dots are mosquitoes. That's a lot of mosquito, and that's a lot of very big mosquito. Um, most years, it's just annoying. Um, this last year, again, because of the weather conditions, the mosquitoes were so bad that reindeer farmers, which uh, reindeer herding is, is one of... Um, one of the industries uh, that support the people in this region, there were actually reindeer that died from blood loss because of so many mosquitoes. So another challenge to navigate through. A third, um, another, something that probably wouldn't anticipate to be a potential conservation issue, uh, and that would be mammoth tusk harvesting. So uh, it turns out one of the sources of ivory uh, that's available to people is, is not just living animals like elephants uh, or walruses or rhinos, but also prehistoric mammoths. So this is a washed out area by a river. And underneath this washed out area, you can see embedded in this bank is a mammoth tusk. Uh, and so the mammoth tusk hunters can kind of tear up the land as their vehicles, um, which are hardcore all-terrain vehicles, navigate to, to reach these locations. So collectively, despite the fact that it's a vast, open, undeveloped landscape, um, increasing human pressures and climate change um, have the potential to cause issues. However, of everywhere along the Siberian Crane's migratory journey, we are in the best spot in the north um, because of low population density, but um, also in the last year, incredibly exciting news, two new national parks were formed. One where this says Kittalik Wildlife Refuge, Kittalik WR, um, that was upgraded to a national park. Um, and then a second national park was created with polar bears in mind. Um, and so collectively between those two, 70% of the core breeding habitat for Siberian cranes in this area are now set aside and protected um, for cranes. And that means more resources, higher levels of protection, more staff to monitor, um, all incredible things. So the, the breeding range is in really good shape for Siberian cranes. That is less the case once birds start migrating south. So these birds are so large and they travel so far that they have to short stop halfway through and replenish their reserves um, for over a month. And so they visit wetlands uh, in northern uh, in northeastern China, as well as in eastern Mongolia. Uh, and, and they are really depending on those wetlands to have sufficient food for them to build up their fat reserves and then continue and complete their migratory journey. The challenge is, is that this portion of northeastern China, um, like much of China, is incredibly developed. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean developed for cities, but this landscape is one, has one of the longest histories of um, civilization and cultivation anywhere. And so unless land is very inhospitable, unless it's very mountainous or rocky, um, the habitats these guys prefer are wide open places. And that is um, perfect land for agriculture. And so there is very little wetland habitat left. In fact, most of it is in a small number of areas that are now protected as this NNR that you see, that stands for National Nature Reserve. And so the fortunate thing is a lot of the last remaining wetland habitats are set aside and protected in these National Nature Reserves. Um, over the span of the last seven or so years that this project has been going on, um, there have been some beneficial changes um, for cranes. One is the government has really cracked down on uh, human activity in those reserves. And so that those lands are now being set aside um, more exclusively for wildlife. 
Um, another plus is that those um, land managers in those national nature reserves in partnership with um, the International Crane Foundation have been taking a new look at how they manage those lands. The traditional way to manage wetlands was kind of a set it and forget it um, philosophy. But these wetlands are like the wetlands in the eastern or in the western half of the United States. And, and actually, we've been connecting folks. Um, the International Crane Foundation has been facilitating um, cross um, cultural information exchanges between folks in China and land managers uh, in the Western US. These drier habitat wetlands uh, require dynamic management. So you have to continually let some wetlands drop down and dry out while some wetlands stay wet to control changes in um, uh, salt levels in the water, as well as changes in the plant community. Um, because if you don't, then slowly a wetland will turn from ideal for Siberian cranes uh, to no, lar lo no longer being useful. And so having a landscape mosaic approach is critical to maintaining this network of different wetlands in different states of succession, some of which are at the perfect place for Siberian cranes at any given time. So those changes are, are really exciting. Um, however, if we just looked at the National Nature Reserves, we'd really just be limited to those few spots that are already set aside. And there are some locations where they are much more of a working landscape where people are utilizing the wetlands and cranes are utilizing the wetlands. And so that's been a, a real expansion opportunity um, uh, for the International Crane Foundation is to build connections in with those communities and really facilitate a great working relationship so that people can use the wetlands in the way that they need to, but tweak how they do that so that the land is still usable for cranes as well. All right, and the final stage of our migratory journey here is to reach the wintering grounds. Now, um, Siberian cranes are unusual um, among birds because all of the world's remaining Siberian cranes rely on one, just one wintering location, and that is Poyang Lake. So what we see here, this line I'm tracking with my mouse, this is the Yangtze River. And as it goes past Poyang Lake, which empties into the Yangtze, it continues on and at the mouth of the Yangtze is Shanghai. And that's where the Shanghai Disney Resort is. And that resort opened um, about, about five years ago now. Uh, and so there's a hydrological connection as well as a, a pretty close distance connection uh, between these two locales. It's a, it's a four hour bullet train ride or an hour and a half uh, plane flight to get between the two areas. But this lake here, the reason Siberian cranes all go to this lake is again um, a, a result of the level of development in this um, broader region. This is one of the last remaining areas that still maintains high quality habitat for Siberian cranes. And here's the reason why. This is the po this is Poyong Lake in the summer. Um, this is this lake. Uh, fortunately, is not dammed. Uh, but there is so much water that feeds into this that in the summer, it floods up and it fills this whole basin here and becomes one massive lake. It's the largest lake contained within mainland China in the entire country. But in the winter, those water levels drop dramatically by up to 20 meters. And what was one big lake separates out into this network of sublakes. Now, each and every one of these sublakes when it's shallow like that, then it can support uh, Siberian cranes foraging in it. Now there are two protected areas in the main areas, the main chunk where uh, Siberian cranes go. There's the Poyang Lake National Nature Reserve here and here, and there's the Nanjishan National Nature Reserve right here. And um, these two areas are a little different than the ones we were talking about farther north, uh, because while there are some areas of those national nature reserves that are set aside just for wildlife, there's also areas that are more multi-use for both wildlife and people. And in those areas that are multi-use, as well as in the areas surrounding, again, we find this situation um, of a highly 
developed uh, landscape. So up on the top of this, well, first across, across the top, you'll see this dike that controls some of the water flow um, or how water moves through this. And um, something that I should have mentioned earlier is those different sub lakes that I talked about, when the water levels drop down, the water movement between in and out of those sub lakes is controlled by dikes. In the summertime, the water levels are flooded up above all of those water control structures. But in the winter, they actually do control um, water to a much greater extent. Um, these ponds you see here are for uh, fishing. And then in the back there, you can see fields for rice cultivation. Uh, fishing is also a huge industry um, there. In some places where those outflows from um, outflows from water control stu structures are located, they set up nets on the other side of the outflows, open up um, the outflow, the water comes pouring out and the fish get caught in the nets. Um, in other spots, fishing is more like this, where you either take a boat out um, to throw hand nets out, or you've got nets that are um, more set in place. And so you've got um, all of these different extractive industries that the local communities rely on. Uh, and um, you've also got water management uh, that really strongly impacts the ability of cranes to access the foods that they need. So the International Crane Foundation's approach, which, which I think is a very a smart and, and healthy one, is not to say, people, you need to leave these areas. Instead, they say, how can we tweak and modify these areas so that your, your, your livelihood benefits, you get more economic bang for the amount of um, effort you put in. But at the same time, we can do that in a way that um, guards the time that Siberian cranes uh, need to be utilizing these habitats most. Another challenge, oh, Stephanie, jump on in. I have a quick question. Now, because the cranes are going into the areas with the rice cultivation, and because the cranes eat the aquatic plants, has there been any issues of them eating the rice um, of the, 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 the vegetation while it's growing? That's a fantastic question. Um, the answer is no and yes. Uh, and so what I mean by that is um, Siberian cranes, I'm, you're absolutely right. You're spot on that they, um, that they really like that aquatic um, based vegetation. However, when natural food supplies crash, like that actually happened this year, unfortunately during the summer, the floods were so high and the water was so turbid, filled with sediment, that it actually stopped the ability of sunlight to filter down all the way through the water down to the bottom of the lake. And that's where the plants that the Siberian cranes feed on grow. And so if there's no light, then there's no plant growth. And so those tuber numbers crashed. Um, and so this year, instead of being able to just rely on their natural food supplies, Siberian cranes are actually out in the fields uh, and they're actually feeding on some of the plants that are in the fields. They, as of right now, they don't cause really large impacts um, to rice. Uh, it seems like they're foraging more on other kinds of plants out in those rice fields. But the image that you're seeing right now is another kind of farm where they feed much more intensively. This is a lotus pond. So that's another one of the plants that's cultivated in this area. Fortunately, the cycle of lotus plants and when purple martins are, well, the cycle of planting and harvesting for lotus is offset from when purple, or not um, purple martins, that's next, um, when Siberian cranes are present. And so um, after the lotus has been harvested, some of the lotus seeds are still present, some of the lotus tubers, and that's what, um, what these cranes will move in and forage on. Now, this photo also shows another challenge, which is um, photographers. So it's fantastic that birding and wildlife photography are a trend that is rising in China. However, that um, pastime, that hobby, that industry, um, needs to develop best practices so that cranes are allowed to do what they need to do without being disturbed or interrupted um, by those photographers. So collectively, the next steps uh, in all of this are actually similar to some of the spots or to similar to some of the things that I chatted about um, for 
the migratory portion, the staging and stopover portion for Siberian cranes. How do you manage water levels? How do you manage fishing practices so that those cranes can still get in there and feed adequately? How do you build relationships um, with local communities and with the photography uh, industry as well as um, more hobbyist photographers to say, we love that you are so passionate and excited about wildlife. Here's how you can do that and celebrate that and pursue that hobby in a way that's not having a negative impact. Um, and I'm very happy to say that, it, that it's working. So when this project started, there were less than 4,000 cranes. And at the last count, um, we had pushed up over 5,000. So that is a huge change in a short period of time um, and really speaks to um, how effective the International Crane Foundation has been at their efforts. All right, I'm going to pause just for a second. Any Siberian crane questions? I do have another quick question. Fire away. So, um, because this goes back to the permafrost, I remember a few years ago I heard about the permafrost melting and then something like about anthrax coming out and killing some of the reindeer population. Yeah. Is there any disease issues affecting the cranes as well? That's a great question. Uh, not that we have documented um, in any kind of systematic or widespread um, way. So um, that anthrax issue, so, so anthrax is naturally occurring and it can sit down frozen in that permafrost for long periods. And then like you were saying, when it thaws, if, uh, if a reindeer forage is near there, then it can end up being infected. Um, but uh, Siberian cranes don't seem to have that same uh, issue of either exposure or impact due to that disease. Um, and again, we, we, we haven't seen any major outbreaks recently of other diseases, um, which is fantastic news. The downside and the risk for cranes in Poyong Lake, as well as in some of those staging and stopover areas, is this is the classic case of all of our eggs are in one basket. Um, because if something happens to those key locations, they can have really big impacts. And so making sure that those spots are protected and then moving out to create additional buffer areas, um, hopefully encourage cranes to maybe go to other spots in that wintering area, um, utilize other locations in those staging stopover areas. That provides a little bit of uh, habitat insurance for lack of a, a, better, a better term. Great. And so then I have another question. Yes. You showed that map that shows the Poyang Lake and then the surrounding areas and there's the two uh, wildlife refuges but there's yes. kind of like a corridor in between yes on the picture on the right the yeah. corridor in between is not a part of the reserve now are they looking to maybe join those reserves into one or is there protections in between do you know that's a great, um, a great question. And, you know, a lot of that area in between stays wet throughout. Um, so looking at it just from the perspective of, um, of cranes and other waterfowl, that might have a little bit of a less of a, of a lower value. It's really those that this kind of like mosaic of smaller um, sub lakes that are the critical habitat in the winter because that's where the water levels fall low enough that um, that the birds are able to forage. Um, I am not aware of any additional efforts to um, to set aside additional protected land. The the real push in Poyong has been a building um, strong connections between the national nature reserves and the adjacent communities because sometimes they're not always on the same page. Um, and then outside those national nature reserves, building up um, solid relationships with community members so that they're not relying just on the national nature reserve management to provide quality yeah. habitat for those, uh, for those birds. So that yeah. corridor in between and the broader areas surrounding it, um, that's still important habitat, but it's going to be through community engagement that those habitats are managed in a way that benefits cranes um, as opposed to, at this point, as opposed to kind of a top-down change of formal protections. Excellent. And then my final crane question, is was it pretty easy to get uh, the 
folks and areas in China on board? Because I know the crane has a lot of cultural significance. So was it easy to get them to want to protect them? That's a fantastic question. And I should have mentioned this earlier. One of the, I, I hinted at it, but I didn't say it explicitly. So if you remember back to that map of the Western population that's gone and the Eastern population that is still with us, the difference is hunting pressure. So cranes were actively hunted for food throughout the West, whereas in the East, whether you're up in Northern Russia or whether you're down in China, cranes are culturally revered and respected. You go far enough back and there was still hunting pressure, but the, the federal governments have, have made very strict, very clear, no hunting policies. And that's coupled with a cultural, um, uh, cultural respect for those species. Um, and so that direct impact of mortality, that is taken away. And it, and it clearly makes a huge difference in the, in the ability for a species to, to thrive. I'm not sure I answered your question though. Did oh, I? Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Any other questions? Those were great. Uh, none, you may carry on and I'll uh, monitor the chat. And if there's any other questions that pop up, I will ask. Fantastic. So I wanted to, so, so we took a, a, a really deep dive into just one of those saving wildlife um, partnerships, um, in this case with the International Crane Foundation. Um, a big chunk of what Disney Conservation does as well Instead of just um, looking outside of our borders, we look within the properties that, that we manage globally. And there's a lot of them. Um, so we have a number of different parks around the world. And then there's um, you know, different teams, different groups of, of Disney in, in, in lots of different locations that collectively add up um, to a lot of property. And, and, and part of what we do is to look at those spots and say, all right, we want to create amazing experiences for our guests. We want to create great places for, um, for our staff to work, but how can we also create incredible habitats at the same time um, for wildlife to thrive in those spots? And, and so that really accounts for another big chunk of what my job entails and what Disney Conservation Collectively is, is trying to accomplish. From a bird perspective, the most basic need is having bird monitoring programs at our different properties so we know, A, what we started with, B, as we try different management techniques, what's working and, and what's not, um, and then C, we can figure out, okay, how can we add new or try additional things to draw in uh, additional species or bolster up uh, existing populations. Uh, and so we have those kinds of monitoring programs here at Walt Disney World, um, at areas in the Bahamas, um, but I wanted to tell the story in particular um, of the Shanghai Disney Resort. So this is a picture of the Shanghai Disney Resort Hotel um, on a spot called Wishing Star Park Lake. Now, uh, exactly the opposite of uh, the hotel that you see behind is the Shanghai Disneyland or is Shanghai Disneyland. Uh, and so this lake sits right in between resorts uh, and um, the park itself. And it's a hundred acre lake surrounded by two miles of nature trails um, with vegetation um, surrounding, surrounding it all along the way. Um, now I'll show you some pictures of it in just a little bit, but before we go there, when this property was first purchased, there was no lake here. This was all um, developed land. And so what we're looking at now is basically a, a massive habitat restoration project. And so some of that uh, restored uh, habitat is more manicured, like in this picture in the middle. Um, but some of it, like the picture on the left, is a walkway through much more uh, naturalistic wetland habitat. And there's an island in the middle of the lake that's entirely um, unmanaged uh, and, and let go for wildlife. Uh, and so we've got two monitoring programs. One, we've got a, a bird monitoring program um, throughout, but we also have, um, I'm sorry, a butterfly monitoring program uh, throughout, but we also have a bird monitoring program. And, and this, this one is near and dear to my heart. When I started uh, in May of 2015 with the company, I, I like showed up at Walt Disney World and three days later, I was on a plane to China to design this monitoring program. At that point, um, 
most of the vegetation hadn't been planted yet. It was basically water and walkways. And so over the course of my time with Disney, I've been able to see the power of what a restoration project can do. And we went from zero birds at this location to at last count 110 different species had colonized uh, Wishing Star Park. And some of those represent resident species in the Shanghai region. Uh, that slowly expanded and colonized uh, the park. Um, some of those, uh, a, a large chunk, represent species that breed farther north and come down in winter. Uh, and then a smaller um, chunk are birds that migrate through uh, the Shanghai region uh, between summer and uh, wintering grounds, but collectively 110 species. Some of them are um, China endemics, like this Chinese bulbul here. Here we've got a Chinese spot billed duck. And then some of them are um, birds that you can see here as well. So this common coot, you know, is the common sight throughout. But whether it's a rare species, whether it's endemic species, whether it has a global distribution, um, in addition to providing habitat, um, this is another key value of that location. Uh, Shanghai. Uh, in any region or in a country known for its level of development, the Shanghai region is on the extreme end of that. There is very little green space left um, in that region. And so because of that, uh, the connection or the ability to connect with nature is, is pretty rare. And, and one of the unique things about Wishing Star Park um, is it's one of the easiest places uh, to really see, experience, um, bird life uh, in up close and personal uh, kind of way. So we partner with the Shanghai Wild Bird Society and they monitor a, a number of different locations in addition to, to helping us monitor Wishing Star Park. And, and that's what they've said is that really kind of the, the, the distinction that sets this park apart. And so um, a, a, a tremendous opportunity uh, as well as a value of this location is partnering with local schools, partnering with um, uh, local adult and community groups to bring people out and give them an opportunity to see um, nature functioning in, in a healthy and restored habitat. All right, it is 7.57. Uh, so Stephanie, quick time check. Do you want me to run through a little bit of Purple Martin goodness or do you want to call it here? Let's talk about the Purple Martins. Let's uh, talk about the Purple Martins. Fantastic. All right. Well, for the final section here, I wanted to bring it on closer to home um, here to Walt Disney World. The, the last kind of chunk of what Disney conservation does is we've picked a few species and we've really tried to dive deep to be leaders uh, in the conservation uh, of those species uh, and, and really try uh, and, and maximize our ability to, to ability to on our properties, um, do everything we can to help those species, create opportunities for our staff to get uh, hands on dirty, really be the conservationist much beyond and outside just the Disney conservation team to drive that work. Uh, and then leverage that to get other people uh, excited about what they can do in their own lives. Uh, and then the final layer of that is working with other organizations beyond our borders to um, expand out the impact so it's not just something that stays within the bounds of uh, a Disney property, but it really uh, expands to the range of that species. And so the project I manage uh, that kind of hits that ambassador uh, conservation project um, role is Purple Martins. Now I know Dr. Anna Forsman gave you an incredible presentation on all things Purple Martins. So I'm not going uh, to go into any of the nitty gritty of, of Purple Martin biology um, that she covered. Um, and I'm not also, I'm not going to go into all of the different partnerships and different research projects that we are collaboratively working on, because I know she touched on those. Um, instead, I wanted to share just some of the cool and fun stories um, that we've discovered over the course of the years of the Purple Martin project. So Purple Martins uh, have been at Walt Disney World for about 20 years now. So in 1998, uh, a house went up at Disney's Animal Kingdom and a house went up at Epcot. Um, on the Animal Kingdom side, it was just a, a passionate um, 
zoological manager who wanted to try and help out um, Purple Martins backstage. Uh, at Epcot, it was actually part of the Flower and Garden Festival. Um, there was a garden where they said, hey, how can we showcase how gardeners can help wildlife as well as create beautiful spaces for themselves? And so they said, oh, we'll put up a Purple Martin house and Purple Martins came and nested in it. Wasn't the original intention, but the Purple Martins loved it, guests loved it, and away we've gone from there. And so year on year, since 1998, we've added more and more houses until today we're at about 22 houses, a little over 500 nesting compartments across, across property. So obviously 2020 didn't go as uh, any of us had expected. So we don't actually have data for, for 2020 because of you know, park shutdowns and furloughs and things like that. But in 2019, we had 219 nests um, across property, over a thousand eggs laid. Um, every chick that um, is hatched out from Walt Disney World gets its own unique leg uh, ID band. So we can see who comes back and where they go next. Um, once a year, we try and catch all of our adults as well and uh, give everybody a health check and give them unique identifier bands as well. So we captured 371 adults. Uh, so we've got a big Purple Martin factory going on here at Walt Disney World. Now, in addition to providing that baseline level of useful or of important nesting habitat, uh, because if you don't have Purple Martin houses, as you know, you don't have Purple Martins, um, we leverage and build on that um, to get our guests excited. As much as we can, we do the nest checks, we do the research process right up close in front um, of folks so that they can get a chance um, to see something that they never realized was there right in their own backyards or in their own communities flying over their heads. Uh, and so that's something that I love about this project is the ability um, to leverage enthusiasm through conservation research that happens right up front and personal, um, right up, right up uh, close and in front of you live. The other thing that allows us uh, to do is to have um, essentially a, a research base where we can ask lots of interesting questions uh, and really dive deep into the biology of this species uh, to provide answers that help us in partnership with our collaborators uh, to drive Purple Martin conservation across the whole range for the species. And so we do that at an event we call Purple Martin Palooza. And that's when we catch all of those different birds, um, all of those different adult birds rather, and give them those health checks, give them those um, bands. But some of our birds also carry tracking devices. Uh, and uh, I won't go into the, the variety of all the different types of tracking devices we've used, all the different things we've learned from those tracking devices. I wanted to show you, though, uh, the Rolls Royce of tracking devices that we started using uh, two years ago now. So um, old school uh, tracking devices was that, <coughs> excuse me, um, Old school tracking devices could only record a very small number of points because the battery wasn't um, robust enough to collect more. Um, but these guys, if you see this little copper disc right there, um, that's actually a solar panel. And so that allows these to be recharged by the sun. And so you can get multiple points over the course of the entire uh, migratory season from where they um, nest here at Walt Disney World all the way down to Brazil and back. Uh, and so from that, we've learned incredible things about these birds that, that really showcases um, what amazing, athletes is not the right word, but what an incredible physical performance they're, what incredible physical feats of performance they're capable of. Um, so for instance, uh, this bird went from uh, Florida stopped over in Cuba for the night and then headed into Central America before heading on down. You'll notice that between Honduras and Costa Rica, this point was taken uh, in the middle of the night when that bird started this trip and just kept on going. A different bird's track, that bird left the southern tip of Florida and flew nonstop 750 miles all the way to the coastline of Honduras. Um, pretty incredible, uh, amazing birds. And these devices are showing uh, intricacies of how birds utilize the habitat down in the Amazon that is, is fascinating. And, uh, and we could spend a lot more time chatting about that, but I wanted to bring it on a little closer to home uh, and focus on what we've learned 
in the central Florida area. Now, before I um, talk uh, a little bit more about Florida Purple Martins, I wanted to come over to the chat. Um, Larry made a great point. He was saying that the uh, common coot is the same as ours, but you make a good point that um, they have differentiated those as two separate species. So thank you for, for calling that out. Spot on. All right, back to Purple Martins. Um, so as you may know from, from Anna's talk, Purple Martins, once they are done breeding, form together into huge pre-migratory flocks. And I knew the general area of where um, Florida, Central Florida's Purple Martin pre-migratory roost was because of weather radar. So what you're looking at is in July, first thing in the morning, right at sunrise, um, the weather radar picks up this dot that expands out in this essentially like weather radar crop circle thing. And what we're looking at is so many purple martins coming up out of the same habitat at the same time and then spreading out across the landscape that it creates this expanding donut effect. So I always wanted to know where that was happening. And thanks to the depth uh, or, and, and the specificity of these tracking devices, um, we got much more information on where that's going on. So this is the same view as what the weather, weather radar was showing. And you'll notice that right here, there's this spot that creates this kind of burst pattern from a central location. That central location are points recorded at night. And then each one of the spokes coming out is a point taken during the day where it went off into that direction to forage and then came back to that roost at night. And it did that over and over and over again for the span of an entire month. Now, this is an island just off the coast of Cedar Key. Uh, and I went out and met up with a biologist, Vic Doig, great guy, um, at the Cedar Key National Wildlife Refuge. And we staked out this island, it's called Snake Key. And we saw a couple thousand purple martins, but we didn't see the massive numbers that I was expecting uh, that you would expect to be there as that weather radar um, pattern had suggested. So what that shows is that um, we still got a whole lot to learn about purple martins and about what their conservation needs entail. What it looks like is happening uh, is that there could be multiple roosts in that area some years. Maybe some years they all gather together into a much more condensed uh, roost location as well. We'll have to get more of those tags on and track them for a greater period of time. However, when we've tagged multiple birds, they've all ended up going to the same roost in the same year. So at least Disney birds are hanging together. We don't know how much that represents all the other birds across Central Florida or what proportion of birds across Central Florida might be using the same kinds of habitats. Stephanie, you got a question for me? Yes. So when the birds were leaving the Cedar Key area, did you go during the day or was that satellite imagery for like a nighttime uh, dispersion? Yeah. So when we were there, we set up shop between uh, Cedar Key and Snake Key in the water on a boat. Uh, and then we positioned ourselves there at sunset. And so we watched as the birds came in from the mainland uh, to roost for the night. And then we counted the birds as they came in. We clocked in, um, we did it a couple of times and the high count we got was about 3000, um, which was cool, but it's still, I still am waiting to see those huge, massive flocks of Martins all coming into roost at the same time. We'll get there, we'll find it. Just hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Oh, and you had also asked about the weather radar. Um, that um, pattern of expanding out, that's right at sunrise that that was recorded. Okay, excellent. So this is a pre-migratory roost, but we also learned fascinating things and intriguing things on the breeding grounds as well. One of them, big curveball, uh, turns out that our purple martins don't always spend the night in their gourds with their chicks. Uh, sometimes, if uh, you guys know your um, know your topography around uh, and your geography around the Orlando metro area, you'll see that there's a big smattering of dots here at the bottom by a large lake. That's East Lake Toho. And it turns out that a number of our birds will fly over to East Lake Toho, spend the night in the reeds on the northeastern corner, and then fly back to Walt Disney World to go back to provisioning their chicks during the day. 
I'm not sure what that's all about. I need to get in my canoe, uh, hopefully this year, and head on over to East Lake Toho and see how many birds are coming in right at night there. Uh, maybe that it's uh, a fairly small number, or maybe it's a pre pre migratory roost um, that's attracting larger numbers of birds. Stephanie, got a question? That's very interesting that they're going to East Lake Toho. Um, that's very nearby where we are. That is in Osceola County. So maybe in the future, there can be some uh, Purple Martin houses put up over there. I love that idea. You've definitely already got Martins in the area. No doubt about that. Um, somebody uh, had asked if the radar data is publicly available. It is. So um, one project that's just waiting for a... Uh, ambitious minded person is to take the kind of thing that I showed and do that for multiple time periods all throughout a season and then do the same thing across multiple years to look at what changing patterns of uh, emergence look like. Um, I've always wanted to do it and I just haven't had the time to tackle that particular project yet. So the story that I want to close with um, may link up with East Lake Toho or could be something totally different going on. Something else we noticed, um, this bulge of dots right here is actually Walt Disney World, but you'll notice offset just a little bit. There's another set of dots. And when I went to check that out, it's actually freeway overpass lights along I-4. And these freeway overpass lights, um, when I went there early in the morning, well before sunrise, I actually was able to set up an infrared camera. That's the image you see on the right or an infrared video camera. And I pointed it at those huge freeway overpass lights. And it turns out that Purple Martins are actually periodically flying under those lights and then flying back up and perching. And this picture on the left that you see, there's a Purple Martin next to the light, as well as one perched on, on top of the light. And as soon as sunrise hits, these birds immediately fly back and go back to provisioning their young. Now, we've used Purple Martin Fitbits. Um, they're called, if you want to get technical, accelerometers to look at activity patterns. And also based on our um, some fine scale GPS work, most Purple Martins don't get active until right around sunrise maybe like 10, 20 minutes before sunrise when it's starting to get light out. Um, but these birds, they were flying around underneath that light well before sunrise. And so our working hypothesis is we think that these birds might come over to these lights to forage on nocturnal insects attracted to the light, take care of themselves, their own energy needs, so that then when they fly back, they're ready to take care of their um, chicks and they don't need to worry about foraging for themselves. Um, if so, that's a very clever adaptation uh, to changes in a very developed environment uh, to benefit themselves as well as, as benefiting their chicks. Um, that drive to get back and forage chicks is so strong within them that that's actually where we've been able to clock Purple Martins flying at their fastest. So um, point to point, I had uh, some GPS devices programmed to record every minute. Uh, and the fastest I clocked them was at a 50 mile per hour stretch between um, in a one minute span. So pretty incredible. Again, an another example of amazing physical ability of, of these birds. So we've still got more to figure out. Uh, this year, I'm hoping to try out some accelerometers that also are equipped with light meters. So I'll be able to say, if birds are flying around before the time frame when they usually get up and at them, are they flying around underneath a light fixture? And so that'll provide another additional um, piece of info to help to figure out this puzzle of what our Purple Martins are doing uh, when they're not spending the night with their chicks. With that, uh, this has been in a lot of fun to share some of our Disney conservation stories uh, with you guys. I thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to listen in and to share uh, your questions. Uh, I also want to show that if you want to follow some of these Disney conservation stories, uh, we've also got Twitter, Facebook, and uh, Instagram accounts, uh, as well as um, the website there at the bottom. And so feel free to, to log on in and, and follow the latest and greatest of, of what we're up to. Um, but all of that said, I wanted to, to come back to something that I said at the very beginning, that, that as much as I was telling 
Disney stories, conservation is not, it doesn't begin and end at Disney. Uh, we really just want to be um, facilitators of a community of people that are passionate, excited, and empowered to make a difference for wildlife. So um, with that, I know that is close to your, near and dear to your hearts as well, and the work that you already do. So I thank you for your efforts uh, to make a difference for bird conservation in our region. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. And I do have a few more questions that I've thought of as well. Absolutely. Yes, and anybody, if you have any last minute uh, questions, please add them in the chat as well. So one of them was in regards to you banding so many birds. Are you seeing a lot of them return uh, year by year? That's a great question. So turns out purple martins are incredibly sight faithful birds. Um, there is one bird that eight years running, she has returned to the exact same house to nest. 50% um, of the time, uh, if we see a bird again, it's going back to the same house. 75% of the time, if a bird, if we see a bird again, it's coming back to the same group of houses because some of our locations have two to four houses as opposed to just a, a single house. So amazing uh, degree of site fidelity um, to the particular location where they've nested before. Um, the ability of birds to, or, or how often birds come back or what those percentages look like really changes with age. So for hatchlings, um, we see very, very low rates of return. Part of that is because going down to Brazil and back, surviving that first trek is incredibly challenging. But we only see three to 8% of our chicks the following year. And if it was really just survival, I think purple martins would be in a much worse state than they are. Um, so I think what's happening is uh, they actually disperse away from the location where they were hatched to other nearby colonies. Uh, and that's a really clever way of avoiding um, inbreeding, simply staying in the region, but going to a spot that's a little farther, a little farther away. The reason we think that they're still staying in the region is none of our birds have been found at another um, research location farther north. Wow. And in all of the years we've been doing our work, we have found just one other banded bird. And that was a bird that was migrating up to Pennsylvania, uh, where Joe Segrist, the president of the Purple Martin Conservation Association, had banded that bird a couple years, um, a couple years before. So once a bird has nested as a one-year-old at Walt Disney World, we see about a third of those back the following year. So that probably is reflective of that level of um, low survival. Um, even your second year going down to Brazil, coming back, it's still a really challenging journey that the birds are still working out the ins and outs of, of how to do that successfully. Once you reach two years old though, then it seems like survival rates stay about the same. And we see, depending on the year, anywhere from 50 to 75% of birds coming back the following year. Wow, that's amazing. Very cool. And a, a comment I had was, I think it's funny how they originally installed the first house at Epcot, kind of as like, you know, oh, this looks pretty. Right. And like how uh, birds. Yeah, exactly. That's funny. And oh, uh, what a what a good idea. Who knew that it would become so successful? And another question I have is uh, now with COVID, I know Disney is opened. Are there any particular tours going on where people could see the Purple Martin houses there? That's a great question. So, so this year, because um, Disney is doing kind of a slow ramp up back to where we were in 2019, um, we don't have um, the resources to support those kinds of guest experiences, as well as from the safety perspective, um, we're, we're not having, at, at Animal Kingdom, we don't have uh, the kind of group guest experiences and tours that we had in the past. We'll get there, um, but this year we're taking a pause on that and we'll pick it up again in the following season. So um, there are a number of houses on show or in public areas where uh, folks can see them. So um, at Epcot over near Mouse Gears, uh, there's five houses. 
uh, at the Magnolia Golf Course. There are two houses at Caribbean Beach Resort. They have two houses and Saratoga Springs Resort has two houses as, as well. Um, so in 2019, we would have advertised um, times when we would go do those, those nest checks. And again, those will come back, but, but this year we're, we're scaling back um, and we shall grow again. Very good. Um, another question I had was, are you, or does Disney have an issue with predation on chicks from say house sparrows or snakes or any other species? That's a fantastic question. Um, so one of the pluses, because purple martins um, almost exclusively nest in birdhouses, there's a lot that we can do to try and um, minimize predation. So one thing we do is all of our poles have a predator guard about a third of the way up. And it's just a hollow baffle that goes around the outside. And so um, nothing is able to climb up and around that. So if you're say a raccoon, you can't get your little raccoon arms around that baffle to get on top of it. If you're a snake and you climb up the pole, then you're stuck in the inside underneath of the baffle. Um, and so that's essentially eliminated ground predation. Um, the, the gourds that we use are horizontal gourds and they've got a long neck. Um, and that provides an additional level of protection as well because if an owl or a hawk lands on um, the porch and they reach in, they can't reach back to the bulb of the gourd, which is where you know chicks and adults hang out. Um, every once in a while, we might get a chick or an adult that wanders a little too far forward, and then they might be a little bit vulnerable there. Um, but that neck still um, provides a, a big increase in protection um, or a, a big increase in predation reduction. Um, that's not to say that there isn't any predation. So. For adult birds, um, it's pretty low still uh, because there's really it's really only um, sneak attack aerial predators that can take a, a purple martin. So kind of the, the typical go-tos are short-tailed hawks, which circle high, high overhead. And then if a martin isn't paying attention, they'll dive bomb out of the sky and grab it. Um, or Cooper's hawks, which are ambush predators around buildings or trees. And uh, we try and put our purple martin houses up away from any, um, or a, a good distance away from structures or buildings. And purple martins seem to prefer houses that have a little bit of distance there. And I think that the reason is, is because of that predator avoidance um, or that desire for predator avoidance. If you're too close to a structure, you're vulnerable to those sneak attacks from, from birds like Cooper's hawks. Um, but the, the ability of purple martins to recognize predators, um, alert the colony, and then mob them and chase off predators is pretty high as well. So really the most vulnerable stage is when fledglings leave the nest for the first time. Um, unlike a lot of birds, purple martins fly right out of the gourd. Um, so there's, there's none of this like, I got to strengthen my wings and figure out how to fly but they don't fly well. So uh, a purple martin adult, you'll see them dipping, diving, very acrobatic uh, in their flight. Whereas a fledgling that's just leaving the nest, they're straight line flying. Big wide turn. Okay, I'm heading back to the colony. Big wide turn. And um, I've, I have seen a crow just very calmly and lazily fly over the top of a fledgling, just very gently kind of scoop it up against its body and then fly off to its nest. So um, that stage where they're not strong acrobatic flyers yet is when the, the chicks are most vulnerable. Wow, that's great. You have those predator guards and just to be able to see those interactions, I'm glad that you've taken uh, some steps to, to help avoid predation, but some you can't help at all. Um, another comment I had was, I think that's very cool how you saw that they were going to the streetlights at night. And I agree, I bet they are hunting for the nocturnal insects. If you think about it, the, uh, the lights outside are basically a smorgasbord. So they're coming for their free buffet. And I look forward to hearing any more info, information you have um, in the future when you learn more about that. Absolutely. I'll be excited to share it. Excellent. And one last thing, 
Uh, thanks for putting up these different uh, social media ways to learn more about Disney conservation. Is there a way people can get in touch with you if they have specific questions? Yes, I should have included my uh, email address on here. I apologize for, for that oversight. Um, so you can always uh, email Stephanie and Stephanie, you have free carte blanche to share my email address out. Uh, if anybody wants it now, it's jason.d.fisher, F-I-S-C-H-E-R at disney.com. Okay, I'm actually typing it. Oh, uh, perfect. In the chat box right now, just for people. That's to smarter. Ask. Excellent. And I just wanted to thank you again for telling us all about Disney's conservation efforts. Um, Disney's in our backyard, and I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of all the great things that Disney's doing, and very happy to hear about the cranes, and uh, it's just very heartening to hear that there are good things happening, and Disney is helping out so many species. So thank you so much for taking the time and coming on and talking about everything. Absolutely. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for the invite. You're welcome. Well, folks, thanks for joining us this evening. It was a great program. Get in touch if you have any questions. And we look forward to seeing you next month in March for our next program. So have a good evening and stay safe, everyone.